you know, we raised seven hundred thousand dollars in December of 2020, and by the end of 2021, we'd raised about 125 million of primary. There is no plan B. I'm going to do it. If you're on the train, you're on the train. If you're not, quite frankly, F you, I'm gonna go and do this. Ultimately, chicken, beef, plant chicken, it's a commodity. You're getting valued on brand. People want something new from someone new. They wanted to see transparency. Consumers care now. At that point, I thought everything was over, honestly, because no funding, big audacious dream, was never gonna get there. And, um, that just felt like it was just a mountain that was never going to be climbed because, you know, the concept of raising money, never mind hundreds of millions of dollars, was never in my mindset. Founders Fund, Peter Thiel, he wrote my Series C term sheet. You know, I remember yeah. meeting him in his office in LA and woke up the next day to, to a term sheet from one of the best entrepreneurs in the world. I'd yeah. been in this country for 18 months. What does that feel like? Snackable content from brand builders. E-commerce and growth marketing leaders. Giving you actionable insights you can apply today. Bite Sized Podcast with Daniel James. Ross, thank you so much for joining me on Bite Size today. Um, I've been a fan. I've been following you for a while in your journey as an entrepreneur, as an athlete. Um, so I'm super excited to have you here today. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know Ross Mackay, who is Ross Mackay? What do you do? What are you passionate about? Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, great first question. Um, from Glasgow in Scotland. I'm a long way from home now, sitting here in LA, but was born and raised in Glasgow. Uh, moved to the US. Um, I actually took a one-way ticket in December 2019 um, with my product. So I'm the founder of Daring Foods. Um, it's a plant protein brand um, sold now nationally across the country. But at the time, we had no customers, no money, no funding. I took a flight here in 2019 um, to meet an investor and a customer, you know, it's 2024. I haven't been home yet. So what am I passionate about? I'm passionate about building businesses and building, building brands. Um, passionate about my family, my wife, I'm passionate about health and fitness. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to be here and talk a bit more about it. Amazing. Our, our story actually has some similarities. I'm from the UK. I was actually born in Aberdeen, yeah, I uh, which isn't, there. yeah, which isn't too far, too far from Glasgow. Um, what made you initially want to come to the US? What was the draw of the US? And, you know, how have you found the differences culturally or doing business for, in the US compared to the UK? Yeah, you know, I, um, I've always been pushed by my family to like, you know, not necessarily move away from home, but like be open to, you know, bigger horizons. I would say I'm unapologetically ambitious about the concept of business and scale. And when you think about scale, you think about America, right? Yeah. You know, you know, opportunity for capital, customer base, brands, some of the brands that I grew up with, they were all born out of America, this idea of the American dream. And I'm from Glasgow, obviously Aberdeen, it's a fairly small <laughs> city in a fairly small country. And um, growing up, I always had the dream of building something big. I didn't really know what it was. And the idea of America always appealed to me. So yeah, very fortunate. I get a lot of messages like, how can I do it? You know, the idea to just move here, um, you know, and, and set up a company. It didn't happen overnight. It took yeah. a little bit of hard work, but yeah, yeah, very happy to be here. I couldn't think of anywhere else better to be. I was gonna say, I feel fortunate as well. I think so many people in the UK see the US as, yeah. like you said, it's from a business perspective, it's like, that's where the big money is. That's yeah. where the, the big market is. But from a lifestyle perspective is not, not to, um, punch down on these places, but it's, it couldn't be more different to places like Glasgow and Aberdeen and, I know. and some of those cities. Yeah, I think I didn't find a lot of uh, similarities but between the people I grew up with and studied with potentially. I would always say, oh, I want to move there and do these things. And they probably thought I was a little bit crazy. Yeah. And I probably was a little bit crazy, quite <laughs> frankly, um, or I'm a little bit crazy. But um, you mentioned to people here potentially what you're working on, your dreams, your goals. And it's, that's great. You know, that's great. How can I help? And I've just had the experience yeah. of meeting so many great people here um, who either try and elevate you, introduce you to people, connect, and there's no sort of animosity or jealousy towards your goals, your dreams, whatever you want to do. And I did yeah. feel potentially when I started the company in the UK, it was probably product market fit, you know, opinion towards what I was building. Yeah. It just didn't sink. So yeah. to me, there was no plan B. I had to go to America and try and build it. Yeah. Amazing. So what, what was that initial catalyst? You mentioned kind of passions like building businesses. What was the catalyst and, and why 
kind of a why plant based? Um, where did that come from? Yeah, I kind of go back to, you know, my early childhood. My father was an entrepreneur. I've always been inspired by what he built and always been kind of pushed towards doing something for myself. Mm. I was the kind of kid that took his packed lunch to the playground and we try and sell it. You know, that was me. <laughs> um, from a fairly young age before it became a little bit more mainstream, I actually opted more towards a plant focused diet. Mm -hmm. So it's from a personal need. I played okay. a lot of tennis growing up, played a lot of sport and just personally felt that reducing my meat intake was better for me. It wasn't really about the environment. It wasn't really about animal welfare. It was just like, I felt better, looked better. Like mm. I didn't eat as much and yeah. things have kind of gone 360 now. My diet's changed. I do incorporate animal protein in my diet. Um, but it was born out of a real need. You know, I was, plant focused. I felt there was a gap in the market and I went out and created something that I felt not only I wanted, but also now a lot of consumers were after. And that yeah. was something cleaner than what was on the market, better branded. And, you know, over the last three years, three and a half years of launching it, we've achieved, you know, some great things with the product. Yeah. Obviously when you launch a business and you build a business it has to be born out of a passion. I think yeah. there's obviously opportunities in the market growing markets, great margin, great business, but ultimately you have to believe in what you're building. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, at the time I, I very much did. Yeah. I think that's so true. That passion and belief, because, yeah. um, when we'll get, we'll get to some of these sorts of things, but if you don't have that passion, I think you'd, that's when you'd give up for sure. Cause it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Um, there's conflict, there's critique, there's challenge. And even when you believe in it, it's not easy and you question yourself and yeah. you doubt yourself. Maybe I don't have conviction, especially when it's not working. Yeah. You know, especially yeah. when you're banging on doors and no one believes in you and you've not got the right packaging or the pricing or no money left. Yeah. Um, but when you wake up in the morning and it's like, it lights you up. Yeah. And it's where you want to spend your time and your energy. Then, you know, a lot of people say, well, don't do what you're passionate about because there might be no money or business in it. But I yeah. ultimately believe you can build a business out of a passion. You can. Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely. And and you, you kind of mentioned there and we were chatting earlier that the business you you, you built and have been building Daring, um, it, it grew incredibly quickly. Um, what sort of challenges did you have to overcome? And yeah. were the challenges, because I know from my personal experience, the, the things I thought would be hard were not the things that were actually hard about building a business. So what were some of those challenges, especially going through such a rapid, rapid kind of growth curve? Yeah, the growth was fairly obscure. You know, I think we grew 9,000% in our first year with fastest growing food company in the country in 2021. Um, we kind of grew from one to a hundred people in a very short period of time. So it was, uh, it was all new to me. Yeah. Um, I think becoming a leader and becoming a, you know, a manager of people was something that was completely obscure as well. Mm. You know, all of a sudden, fairly overnight, I was managing departments, managing people, um, something I've never done before. I played in team sports, and that's the only thing I can kind of relate it to, being a team player, boosting people up, leading people, but it was at such high stakes. Yeah. Um, there was obviously tons of obstacles I was trying to overcome and shipping problems and pro product problems and pricing problems and customer complaints, but... I think what I was told early on from some of my investors that I was very fortunate to get the backing of was, you know, teams probably the most important thing. Yeah. Now you have a team, I have a team, you know, they make us look great often. Yeah. And the, the job of a leader is to do a couple of things really well. And that's to set the vision, um, raise capital if you need it, because no one's going to know the business better than you. And then also to hire the best people in the world, Yeah. you know, and that's what I got very focused on very early on. And, Leading those people, making them feel 13 feet tall as many times as possible was something that was very challenging and took a lot of learning. Yeah. Do you feel you had a natural inclination towards it, though, from a leadership perspective? You mentioned kind of sports and everything. And as much as it was challenging, I feel like some people just rise to those occasions. And even though you're learning on the job, you you, you realize more and more, this is what I'm meant to be doing. Yeah. I want to be that person who's ultimately accountable. And you, you kind of find joy in solving the problems and building the teams and seeing how it develops. Yeah, I think absolutely. It, it did feel like it was something I was interested and passionate about, you know, giving people the sandbox to make their own decisions, you know, giving them 
kind of goals, KPIs, setting the vision, yeah. and then hiring people that had seen pattern recognition towards yeah. success. Yeah. Um, but it comes with its challenges, obviously, because when it's your, you know, baby and your business, no one's ultimately going to care about it as much as you. Yeah. And I had a great experience with a individual. He wrote a book called Amp It Up. Uh, it's called Frank Slootman. It's one of my favorite leadership books. Mm -hmm. And he talks a lot about, you know, the leadership ability to amp it up, to walk into a room and to just add tempo to the, to the business, to yeah. add tempo to the team. Because to a lot of people, it is a nine to five. And to you, it's your life. Yeah. And no one ultimately is going to wake up and care about as much as you. So we did a lot of great things. We gave a lot of ownership to the company, to the employees, to really make them feel like it really was their business as well. And it helped a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. You mentioned there about fundraising. Um, yeah. A, a hot topic, yeah. especially at the moment um, with all the kind of, we won't go into that, but the macroeconomic kind of climate. Um, what was that process like for you? Um, was it something new? Had you done anything like that before? And for anybody who's listening, who is either raising capital or thinking about needing to raise capital for the business, what advice might you give them? Yeah, I want to start with, um, you know, Fundraising to a lot of people is seemed a success. It's not success mm. criteria. It's an obligation, right? Yeah, I uh, my business and the um, unit economics of my company and the scale we were trying to achieve required capital. I think it's not a badge of honor how much money you've raised. You know, becoming profitable and scaling organically is the new success criteria. But money was free in 2020, 2021. Um, I was, you know, fortunate enough to meet a lot of great investors. I always say when you get psychological backing and financial backing running a business becomes really fun yeah um you know we raised seven hundred thousand dollars in december of 2020 and by the end of 2021 2021 we'd raised about 125 million of primary and a, a whole lot more that you know we haven't talked about yeah um from some of the best investors in the world you know mm. founders fund peter Thiel. he wrote my series c term sheet you know i remember yeah. meeting him in his office in la and woke up the next day to, to a term sheet from one of the best entrepreneurs in the world. I'd yeah. been in this country for 18 months. What did that feel like? Uh, you know, I think at the time I didn't really understand what was going on. <laughs> um, you know, we've raised money from a bunch of celebrities, Drake's of the world, Cam Newton's of the world, Post Malone's, Tyson Foods, the biggest chicken company in the world. Yeah. You know, it's it's been a really interesting journey, but ultimately what makes a great company is a great business and allocating that capital successfully yeah. is part of that. Um, but I want to just take a step back to, you know, for anyone raising capital, it is a tougher environment right now. Yeah. Um, you know, what investors are looking for today is not the same as they were looking for maybe in 2021. But um, I think founders who have an ability to talk about the vision, especially early on when there's no data to show that this is going to be successful, mm. right? I'm telling you, this is something that I want to go and do future state. Yeah. Whereas later on in the business, it becomes about what you've done, the data, the growth rate, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but I felt like the common feedback between most of my investors was we're making a bet on you yeah, and your ability to go and execute on this vision. So very exciting journey. Yeah. Hopefully no more fundraising after <laughs> this, but um, I definitely was fortunate enough to meet some great investors and partner with some great people. Yeah, I think you made a, a couple of really key comments in that is like, I've done some small amount of like DTC angel investing and stuff like that, but you hear it from investors all the time. It's it and do you, it's not something to celebrate, it's an obligation, it's yeah. a future state. And so much of it is, well, what's the idea and, and the entrepreneur yeah. who's gonna drive that business? Um, we all watch Shark Tank and yeah. Dragon's Den and my yeah. business partner, Very few Steve's businesses on. are truly remarkable in barrier to entry mm. and when I mean that like when I you know one's really curing you know any problem that we have today it's a me too version of what potentially exists and maybe it's better margin maybe it's better branding maybe it's better flavor maybe it's less of this less of that but ultimately when I've invested in companies as well or I've received investment I'm making a bet on the person yeah do I believe that person is going to go through the challenge the conflict the critique especially an early stage company yeah at a later stage company when you've achieved some sort of product market fit and scale you're looking for different things yeah but I imagine a lot of the viewership here is early on in their journey they're looking for those angel checks those friends and family um, angel rounds so yeah. yes you need to have your 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 business model 
uh, but it's all a what if scenario. Yeah. You know, and that, those, that business plan is as good as the paper you wrote it on yeah. ultimately. But I think the ability to sell yourself and sell the business is probably the highest success factor in raising that first round of capital. Yeah, exactly. And that, that circles back to what you're saying about having passion yeah. about what you're building. Yeah. You know, I think that, that people can tell that you have a passion for yeah. the business. Yeah. Thought leadership, just truly like knowing what you're talking about and caring so much about it. You can see it. Consumers can see it. Investors can see it. Customers can see it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, marketing. This is an entrepreneur marketing brand building yeah. um, podcast. So what's your philosophy to marketing? Um, what kind of approaches and especially within, you know, your current or uh, the current business daring notoriously difficult because you can't taste it. You can't yeah. taste an ad. Um, so how did marketing play a role in the, in the growth of, um, of the brand and just a, what's your overall philosophy to the use of marketing to help scale a business? Yeah. Great question. You know, um, we leaned very heavily on brand marketing. Mm -hmm. I want to say brand, it was large partnership plays. You know, I sold a product that was frozen, sold into retail, Walmart, Target. It wasn't that easy to touch, see, feel, taste. You had to go and buy it. I couldn't really ship samples because not many frozen food companies are achieving success yeah. shipping product D to C. Yeah. So, you know, there was a smaller reliance on paid marketing. Um, and much more effort on sampling, popping up at events, being present at Coachella, partnering with H Wood and Delilah and restaurants across Miami and doing food trucks. So it was a little bit more of those sort of early Red Bull days where you used to see those cars show up with cans. Yeah. We did a lot more of that. It was big brand moments, big brand celebrity partnerships with the Kardashians and yeah. um, different events and festivals where you may go and get you know a chicken tender, you could also get a daring. And we paid to be part of that. Mm. Um, when it comes down to, you know, how my business works, a lot of the capital is invested on trade marketing. Yeah. So working with retailers, um, operating on third party platforms, you know, like Instacart and so on to really drive awareness through that and advertise through that. But yeah. in the beginning we were selling something very obscure. We had to spend a lot of money on advertising, um, and education. Yeah. Um, we did a little bit of podcast advertising and it was so new to us. You know, we had very low, very little household penetration. So we were still testing and learning, but because we didn't sell online, the ability to click on something, go straight to the e-com website and make a purchase, it didn't exist for us. Yeah. Um, so we had to drive people to retailers, yeah. which is a little bit tougher at the time, but uh, brand matters hugely. And I think today what we're seeing is important is this concept of community. Yeah. Um, people want to know how the business is being built. They want to know the founder. They want to know the founder's story. They want to hear podcasts like this. And I think there's great examples of entrepreneurs that we both admire that are doing a great job of actually bringing people on the journey. So I yeah. think, you know, if future state, you know, I would do things a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. You're so right. I think that's been a huge shift I've seen of, you know, it changes by vertical, especially like you said, for a food product or CPG in general, but the days of just build a store, run Facebook ads, like that arbitrage of just yeah. pure digital leverage. I think the brands of the future and where you see brands really winning is when it's underpinning a community and there's a reason for that product existing. And it's really about, I, I totally agree with you, brand marketing matters. Yeah. Um, and I think too many brands maybe deprioritize that mm. due to, well, I can run an ad and track my direct attribution. Yeah. And you didn't have, you, you couldn't even do that no. with, with the brand. So how did you, that's a big bet to kind of do that brand marketing and hope it pays off. Yeah, it's very hard to measure too. Yeah. You know, we do out of home campaigns all over New York. I can't really measure how that drives sales. Yeah. But in my space, what we were understanding at the time was that, you know, ultimately chicken, beef, plant chicken, it's a commodity. You're getting value on brand. There's something you yeah. can't really measure is touch and feel and you get it and it's part of the culture. You know, to think that my product was at Walmart, but also at Komodo in Miami, mm. you know, that's like yeah. a cultural shift in my um, sort of category. It didn't yeah. really, hadn't happened before. Yeah. Um, and the people that were talking about it, the places we were, it was just becoming, you know, exciting for people to, to, to actually, to think people wanted to get excited to queue up and eat plant-based chicken. It never yeah. happened before. And I think that was where we were showing up or which menus we were showing up, who was talking about us. 
um, which parties we were serving at, whether it be the Met Gala or the Golden Globes, or it, it was always on the menu and it was always there. So it happened in drinks, happened in yeah. alcohol with the Casamigas of the world yeah. and Bacardi's and the Red Bulls, but it never really happened in food, especially mm. not frozen food. Yeah. Um, so we felt like that was going to add, you know, value to our business in a way that was almost hard to measure, but it yeah. was very successful for us. Yeah. Do you think first mover advantage plays a part? Um, definitely. I think um, we were fortunate enough. There was two businesses in our space that spent a lot of money educating consumers on why potentially plant-based meat needed to exist beyond meat and impossible foods. They both created $10 billion market caps, raised billions of dollars, yeah. and educated the retail buyer and the consumer that this was potentially a better option. Mm. We could kind of ride on the tailcoats and do something better. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, when they're starting the company, you don't really always want to be first because it can be very expensive to create a category. Yeah. Especially in retail, when you're selling to, a, uh, you know, I think whether it be Whole Foods or a Tesco's or a Boots or a Walmart, to go and educate that buyer on why this needs to be a category and them to take a risk on something with no data is very hard. For yeah. me, I was kind of second or third and could kind of, you know, show them that, yes, it works, but here's why there needs to be a better option. Yeah. Um, I think being number two and three is okay. Yeah. You know, I do. But early mover advantage within my category specifically is it was a retail game. We had a lot. We have 17,000 retailers, 50,000 locations across the country. Yeah. And it's kind of like presence now. And for to take that off is very hard. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you posted something recently on your Instagram page yeah. about... Um, I think it was a failed grant in the early days of the hey, brand yeah. and it, it it didn't come through and i loved what you wrote in terms of like it actually gave you more motivation and i think for any entrepreneur like building resilience is such a key part of how you're gonna ultimately build something sustainable yeah um how did you deal with those sorts of setbacks and just how do you deal with setbacks in business in general um and what advice would you give you know any entrepreneur because yeah. if there's one thing we know, it's it's building resilience and setbacks is, yeah. is kind of a must. Yeah, I've got a little bit of goosebumps thinking about that, actually. I did. I got uh, applied for a grant, £25,000, 2019, I think it was. And um, we weren't successful. And maybe that was the pitch, my product, whatever it was. There's no hard feelings about that. But I think the reason I posted it was that exact reason, to show the next founder of the next business, whether it be in Glasgow or in LA or wherever, that you're gonna get probably a few no's before you get a few yeses. Yeah. At the time, it made me very upset and it made me very much doubt my ability to execute on the mission and the plan. I talked to a few founders and they say the same. The first mm. no's are the hardest. Now I'm Kevlar. Honestly, <laughs> I got told 10 no's today. <laughs> I'm still gonna do it. But, yeah. you know, I definitely think that the ability to sort of operate under this assumption, there is no plan B. I'm going to do it. If you're on the train, you're on the train. If you're not, I'm quite frankly, F you, I'm going to go and do this. Yeah. And I did operate with a chip on my shoulder for a long time. Mm. I think a lot of people will say, oh, I don't worry about, for me personally, I built this thing with a chip on my shoulder. I had no's throughout the process of building the business. Families, family members would tell me you're crazy. Yeah. And... It did give me a little bit of motivation. I think that's okay because, you know, if you hear yes all the time, you t everyone tells you you're great, you probably start believing your own BS. Yeah. And uh, I think that can be a dangerous thing. So, you know, I'm sure you've heard no a million times. That's never going to work. You can't do this. But yeah. again, it goes back to the passion, belief in the business. You do need people to, you need to be malleable. You need to listen to these no's. You need to identify why they said no, if it yeah. made sense. Um, because ultimately you know, everything has holes that needs, you know, you need to pick holes in the business. Yeah. But uh, that, that money would have done us a lot of good. Uh, we nearly sold a lot of the company for pennies on the dollar back then. And, and, and for a long time, I didn't think it was going to work. But yeah. Um, yeah, it was a very interesting time. And, you know, I don't think plant-based meat in Scotland even 2024 <laughs> exists. So no. I'm glad I didn't I would, stay there. I'd be hugely surprised if it does. Yeah. I'm all love to my Scottish listeners. Yeah, I mean, if, beef if... and salmon and whiskey. It's probably a lot of good restaurants, <laughs> but not a lot of good plant-based meat. No, agreed. Um, 
It's interesting just kind of, like you said, reflecting on even my own journey. I think entrepreneurship is this delicate balance between huge self-belief yeah. and some level of self-doubt. And I think it's it's often like, like you said, a chip on your shoulder. When you get those no's, it's like, it's not like it, it's not like it doesn't impact you, but there's a desire to, well, I'm going to prove, yeah. I'm going to prove that I can make this successful. You know, it's almost like you, like you said, you have to learn, but it's, it's, you want to prove those no's that they were wrong and yeah. that you're going to make it work. Yeah. It's like losing a played rugby or tennis growing up. If I lost that team the month before or the year before, it was like never again. Yeah. You know, yeah. never again will we have that feeling. And, um, try, you know, I tried to have a few less no's nowadays, but starting something again from scratch, you know, whether it be today or in the future, I'm sure I'll experience more of those, but hopefully a little bit less and, you know, refine the business model, refine the plan and continue to operate with just kind of a tenacity that doesn't really matter what other people think. You know, yeah. I think that's going to be important. Yeah, exactly. Agreed. Um, let's touch upon prioritization. Um, you actually mentioned in a book about that and I'm a, I'm a big prioritization, how to structure my days yeah. and everything else. But I think for, again, for founders and entrepreneurs, there's so much, especially early days, maybe not knowing exactly what should I be doing? Where should I be focusing my time and trying to build a business? Yeah. Um, you know, what advice again, would you give, um, in terms of what to prioritize your efforts on as a kind of early stage founder? Yeah. I think it depends on what you're building. I'll yeah. start with that. Uh, if it's a physical product, if it's a, you know, food product, for example, or drinks or something tangible, consumer good, not necessarily online SaaS or tech focus, but I'm talking from a physical product. Um, I think the manufacturing is always going to be super important. Yeah. Um, which I'll touch on. I think the brand is going to be super important. Um, the channel strategy where you want to sell it. But I think a lot of people will focus on this concept of brand. They'll get their branding nailed and they'll get the product mocked up. But where are you going to manufacture it? How much is it going to cost? How much are you going to sell it for? Does the business fundamentals make sense? And I, yeah. you know, my wife's starting a company in the hair care space. She's great with brand. She's great with creative, visually phenomenal. But I kept pushing her back, like, let's source the manufacturing. Let's make sure they can produce the product at what price. And mm. then we can worry about that. A lot of people design something, the product will change. I have to go back and redesign the product, yeah. the packaging, the branding, the name, for example. So I would focus on manufacturing, supply chain operations first. Yeah. Make sure financially it makes sense. Then build a brand after that and then focus on the route, route to market. Where am I going to sell? Amazon on my own website. I'm going to sell it through a distributor, et cetera. Those three things, I think, probably become the most important. Yes, of course, access to capital, mm. hiring, and so on. But I wouldn't get too far ahead of yourself. 30, 60, 90 days kind of feel right for me. I like to operate in sprints. Yeah. Um, obviously, as the business has grown now to pretty big team, we operate a little bit further out. I know these fashion brands, they operate years out sometimes. Yeah. But I think very early on, it's hard to really worry about what's going to happen next year. Yeah. Um, but find someone that can make your product build that relationship. If you have to go and visit them, go and visit them. I think a lot of people um, talk about sampling and cost of that, but just building that relationship with the manufacturers that ultimately, if you're not manufacturing yourself, it's going to be your holy grail. Yeah. I think the really key point there is the economics. Yeah. You can have a great looking brand, a great idea, but if, you, if, if the economics don't make sense, you're yeah. really starting from a, a difficult point and running an agency that does marketing for brands, um, it's pretty cut and dry. Yeah. Like great marketing, if there's no margin availability, you can't outmarket bad economics of a brand. No, you're gonna be very reliant on capital. And you're talking yeah. to a founder that's raised a lot <laughs> of money to support bad, potentially bad unit economics over a short period of time. Some businesses need scale to create that margin expansion, right? Yeah. But as long as there's line of sight to it, you're not just joining the dots, there's real visibility, then you can get away with it over a shorter period of time. But, you know, uh, focus on creating a great company. Yeah. You know, um, the rest should fall into place. And I think a great company starts with great business fundamentals. Yeah. How much am I going to make it for? How much are you going to sell it for? How much does it cost me to run the company? 
And if those things can marry up, yes, you can start to spend a little bit more, more money here and there on marketing brand, influencer, team, whatever it may be. But make sure that without capital, without the reliance of capital in today's market, the business is self-sufficient. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I love that. Um, kind of touched upon it there, but, you know, building a company, by definition, company, group of people, um, obviously financially it needs to make money and be profitable and be able to kind of scale and grow. But it's, it's so much more than that. And we kind of mentioned at the beginning, it's about your team, it's the culture. Um, what's been your approach to how you look to develop culture and, and what advice, again, um, would you give other people who are maybe in the earlier stages when it's like maybe got five people, 10 yeah. people, but as that grows, how do you maintain that culture? Um, Cause it gets more difficult to kind of make sure that that culture is being maintained or even improved upon as, yeah. as, the, as the team grows. Yeah, it makes me think a lot. And um, I think there's like a pretty way to answer this and then there's the real way. Let's go the real way. <laughs> um, the culture needs to start with you yeah. as the founder and the creator of the business. And as you hire more people and you almost rely on those individuals early on in the company so much to believe in you, you start to get a little bit too malleable into their ways of working. And I'll say this because, you know, we've, you know, definitely turned over a few staff members in our time, whether they've left or I've had to let them go. But I have felt one of my only regrets was changing my vision to support their ways of working. Mm -hmm. Or else you expect too much, you know, you are operating a certain way, but like ultimately when you lose that, you lose your culture. Yeah. And I think to go back to it, the culture needs to start with you. Who are you as an individual? What are your expectations? At my company, we expect a lot. I expect, you know, the concept of hard work. That I, think, I hate that word, but like you're going to give it your all. And in turn, you know, hopefully we can change your position in life. Mm. Um, but I think you need to identify what kind of company you want very early on. And don't be afraid of that. Yeah. You know, there's books and founders of, you know, the founders of Netflix and Amazon and, or there's companies that are a little bit more friendly. You bring your dog to work, you take four hour lunch breaks and you do what you want and it's all soft and fluffy. And that works for other people too. There's no yeah. right or wrong. But um, given where I'd come from and I would say my personal journey to get here and launch the company, um, I didn't want to create a culture that, accepted average yeah and um i asked for the most people could give and i think it doesn't always work especially you know necessarily in la where <laughs> you know cultures are a little bit different but um don't lose don't lose sight of that despite who you hire and i think hiring is a really important skill for any funder when they achieve that skill to to get advice on get coaching on yeah you know i always say um hire slow fire fast yeah. Take your time hiring, do your reference checks. People are very good over 30 minute interviews, but how are they when they're one year in, 16 months in, the business is not always on straight track. Yeah. But if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. So make decisions quickly, rip the bandaid off um, and just, you know, continue. Yeah, I agree. Um, what do you look for then in, in team members or partners or when you're kind of building teams or establishing partnerships? What type of person are you looking for? Yeah, I think very early on, it's always interesting when you create partnerships or co-found companies with people, it's kind of a flip of a coin. You be the CEO, I'll be the CEO. That <laughs> yeah. sounds great, you know? But a little bit more experience now, I try and pull together different skill sets depending on the category, depending on the product and the mission. Yeah. You know, I'm very business development focused, fundraising sales focused. I have very little experience in um, other aspects of companies. So I'll try and tie those people together. Yeah. Identify the problems, the gaps and bring them in. I always ask one question. I'll give it away here. I've never done it before, but my favorite interview question is if you were to get the job today, we started tomorrow and in three months you left, what went wrong? Okay. And you'll notice that people will start to tell you what they don't like. And if yeah. that doesn't work for you, you quickly learn that they're not right for the company or they're very right. Yeah. Oh, I won't like if you start calling me at 4.59 because I clocked off at 4.58. You know, it's yeah. not going to work in a startup. Yeah, yeah. You know? 
Yeah. And I think that's a question that I very quickly identify people if they're going to work from for my business. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, you can I'll steal use it. that one. Yeah. I've made a note of that. It's hard one. for people to say 